Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. This is Clinical Reasoning Series. Today I am going to discuss the case number 8. Please note that this discussion is only for academic purposes and cannot be directly related to the patient care. Here is the clinical summary. This is a 10 year old boy who is presenting with on and off fever for past 2 weeks. You begin to examine the child. He is plethoric, having clubbing of fingers along with perioral sinuses. There is no history of trauma preceding the events. And it is also mentioned that the child was having normal developmental milestones. The second part of the question says that the child is being evaluated and this picture is given in the question. You can notice that this is a CT scan where you can see something which is occupying this area of the brain. This is what we call it as a space occupying lesion inside the brain. And how does it appear? It appears as a single lesion. It appears as a single lesion. You can see that there is something which is white surrounding that area. Can you see that? This is the white something like the capsule okay surrounding that uh, particular space occupying lesion along with that you can see that surrounding that there is edema there is edema what we also call it as perilesional edema and if you do the contrast okay CT along with the contrast you will see that there is a ring enhancement in this lesion there is a ring enhancement in this lesion. So what do you think is the lesion that we are encountering in this particular boy? This is nothing but brain abscess. So the diagnosis in this particular case is brain abscess. The question is after the child is stabilized, what is the next investigation you are planning to do? Is it CT orbit, HRCT temporal bone, echocardiography or karyotyping? One option which can be easily ruled out by many students is karyotyping because I have mentioned that the milestones are normal and there is no other dysmorphic features I have mentioned in the question. So probably it is not a chromosomal or a genetic disorder. So you can rule out that option of karyotyping. Options remaining are CT orbit, HRCT temporal bone, echocardiography. Remember brain abscess is usually secondary to a focus of infection elsewhere. Brain abscess by itself is an infection but that infection would have come from elsewhere to find out the source of infection only you are doing this investigation. For example, in case of orbital cellulitis, in case of orbital cellulitis, you can do the CT RB. And in case of this otitis media or in case of mastoiditis, you are going to do the HRCT of the temporal bone. And in case of some congenital heart diseases, CHDs, congenital heart diseases, you can do echocardiography. So which one to be done is the question in this particular scenario. So to arrive at the answer, again look at the question from a different perspective. Number one I would want you to remember is that if the brain abscess is located in the frontal area, then the source of infection was probably from the orbit, for example, orbital cellulitis. Second is, if the brain axis is located in the parietal or temporal areas, it could be from cyanotic congenital heart disease, CCHDs, cyanotic congenital heart disease, especially those associated with right to left shunt. I will come to the explanation of this in a while. As of now, remember. Third one I would want you to remember is that in case of temporal lobe involvement or occipital lobe involvement, you have to think about the source as otitis media or mastoiditis. In this particular question, where you are seeing the brain abscess is in the parietotemporal area. Are you able to follow? Parietotemporal area. So, possibility is either congenital, cyanotic congenital heart disease or otitis media bar mastoiditis. So which option can be ruled out here? The option I can rule out is CT orbit because if it was orbital cellulitis, the frontal lobe has to be involved. But here we are looking at uh, abscess in the temporoparietal area. So it can be HRCT temporal bone or echocardiography. Now go back to the clinical summary again. It is mentioned that this child is having cyanosis. That this child is having cyanosis. Okay, which gives you a clue to cyanotic congenital heart disease. Long-standing cyanotic congenital heart disease can also be associated with clubbing of the fingers also. Plethoric appearance is due to associated polycythemia which are seen in this particular group of disorders. So main clue I would put up is the cyanosis followed by clubbing. So here 
the diagnosis is cyanotic congenital heart disease and i can rule out hrct so the answer is option c which is echo cardiography and what is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease to be associated with a brain abscess it is nothing but the most common congenital cyanotic congenital heart disease what is that it is tetralogy of fallow tof now let us try to understand why in uh, tetralogy of fallow or a right to left shunt you are having this brain abscess you can notice that the venous return i am talking about the systemic venous return is going to come from the periphery and from the systems enters via the svc and ivc into the right atrium are able to follow this from right atrium it enters into right ventricle and then into the pulmonary artery and finally it is going to enter into the lungs remember when the venous return is coming okay it may have some infection it may carry some infection or microbes from the peripheral circulation are able to follow suppose let us imagine that in the periphery the patient had an infection peripheral infection the patient had a peripheral infection that was carried by the blood which was returning by from the ivc or the svc so it's a peripheral infection which is being carried into the heart so once it enters into the heart it enters into right atrium then right ventricle then into the pulmonary artery and finally it is going to enter into the lungs now please remember this point for your exams lungs act as a effective filter wherein they filter out the microorganisms are able to follow this so that the blood which is coming out from the lungs is free from any microorganisms and you know that pulmonary veins are going to carry the blood out from the lungs they are going to enter into the left atrium and left ventricle into the aorta then into the systems so that is why even if there is a peripheral infection because of the filtering effect of the lungs this infection is not getting transmitted to the systems again are able to follow this now let us look at the case of tetralogy of fallow you all must be knowing the components of tetralogy of fallow one of the components of tetralogy of fallow is that there is subpulmonary stenosis in this area is it not so the blood cannot flow freely from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery so it creates a sort of obstruction or decreased flow into the pulmonary artery are able to follow so thereby lungs are also having decreased perfusion okay so you can very easily imagine that the filtering effect of the lung is also going to go down and also you should remember that there is a communication between the right ventricle and the left ventricle here is it not what is that it is nothing but ventricular septal defect vsd now via this ventricular septal defect the blood which is coming into the right ventricle because fully it is not going into pulmonary artery it can have this shunting okay wherein it goes from right ventricle into the left ventricle and then into the aorta then into the system so a peripheral infection is being carried over okay across the heart chambers into the aorta then entering into the systems which include all your systems like cns respiratory cns kidney and the other systems as well so remember this is what we call it as paradoxical embolism this is what we call it as paradoxical embolism why it is paradoxical because something is originating from the venous system but it is entering into the systemic circulation or the arterial system something which is originating from the venous side entering into the arterial side that is why i call it as paradoxical embolism and because infection is what we are talking at this is also called as septic embolism this is also called as a septic embolism and if this septic embolism is going to involve the central nervous system it is going to result in abscess so that is why children with cyanotic congenital heart disease especially the right to left shunt are going to be associated with abscess as an important complication which is what we are encountering in this particular scenario talking about brain abscess as the topic which is the most common organism associated with brain abscess the question your answer should be streptococci answer should be streptococci especially the anaerobic group has to be remembered and in this the most important group of streptococci associated with brain abscess are streptococci mellieri group please make a note of it this is commonly asked in your exams and if they ask you what is the investigation of choice what is the investigation of choice your answer always going to be mri of course i have shown in this particular question ct picture only that can be used to say initial investigation but the investigation of choice is always mri so what do you think should be the treatment in this particular scenario if there is a question obviously it's an infection so you have to use the antibiotics 
you have to use the antibiotics the preferred combination of antibiotics are third generation and just rating t3 for third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or cefotaxin along with that you have to add metronidazole in the treatment okay this is what we are using in the typical streptococcal infection suppose you are suspecting and usually something like staphylococcal infection also additionally you can add vancomycin to this treatment regimen or if you don't know the organism which you are treating probably then all the three drugs have to be started in the treatment a very very important point to be remembered is that the duration of treatment is long duration it is 4 to 6 weeks please remember that these abscesses also should be drained surgically that should be done in almost every case surgical drainage along with antibiotics is the treatment of choice if i ask you what are the other complication which can be expected in children with uh, tetralogy of fallow what will be your answer number 1 is brain abscess number 2 is uh, thrombosis especially cerebral thrombosis especially cerebral venous thrombosis one of the important uh, reasons which has been described for the cerebral venous thrombosis to develop is that these patients i have told you in the question itself they they will have associated polycythemia and this polycythemia is something which is going to disturb the flow of blood and predispose the patient to develop thrombosis so polycythemia one of the very important reason for development of cerebral venous thrombosis third important complication which you need to know for your exams is bacterial endocarditis we are talking about complication encountered in tetralogy of fallow bacterial endocarditis fourth important complication which you must be reading in detail where the patient has increasing episodes of or increasing severity of cyanosis especially with exertion what is that called it's called cyanotic spells please make a note of it cyanotic spells are you able to follow this so in this today's discussion i have described in detail about a um, important complication in tetralogy of fallow which is brain abscess and i have just mentioned the names of other complication which you encounter in tetralogy of fallow so that concludes today's discussion hope you have liked this video please share with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to this channel please press the bell icon so that you get notified of the new videos which are being posted to this channel i will see you in the next clinical case scenario very soon thank you and have a good day